Good afternoon. Welcome to another Van Deventer Black webinar. This one is focused on the 2020 legislative update for the construction industry. I'm Jim Harvey, a partner at Van Deventer Black, and I'm here along with Ann Bebo. We thank Kristen Fletcher and Jennifer Serrano who run our marketing department and enable us to host these types of presentations for clients. The 2020 legislative year was very active for the construction industry particularly for companies that work with state and public agencies. Uh, the General Assembly adopted significant legislation on a variety of issues directly affecting uh, our clients. Uh, they include infrastructure funding, contracting issues, labor and employment agreements. Many of these issues should cause you to re-examine and possibly revise your contracts, how you respond to contracts, in your labor and employment policies and practices. Based on the questions we get from our clients, the topics we'll cover today are of general interest and are not specific advice for any individual. For more detailed information <coughs> on these and other construction industry issues, we have articles on our website, www.vanblacklaw.com, and we invite you to consult with those. We also invite you to call or email us or any attorney you work with at Van Deventer Black after this presentation about specific action you may want to consider uh, to better advance your business. Through programs like this, we are providing updates and supplements to our information all the time. Today, we are using the Microsoft Teams Live Events platform, and all presenters are working remotely, uh, you can ask questions using the chat feature of the Teams program. On the right side of your screen, you will see a Q&A section. Please type in questions by clicking on the Ask a Question button in the bottom right corner of your screen. I will review them and publish them to the group, and then hopefully we can answer those questions either as we go along or at the end of the presentation. Uh, in the event you're unable to input a question, feel free to follow up through the email address events at vanblacklaw.com or contact us directly using the information uh, on the presentation slides near the end of the, our, our program. Finally, we will send you a, a thank you email after this event that will include these slides and a link to the audio for this presentation. Next slide, please. So in the in about the next hour, we're going to talk about uh, some of the new infrastructure funding that will impact construction companies, some positive laws for contractors, some uh, as well as some changes to public procurement law, some new wage laws, uh, project labor agreements and other employment laws, changes regarding payments to subcontractors, the right and the right of offset and then issues looking forward that may be coming in 2021 with the next General Assembly. Next slide. As I said, there'll be two of us talking today. Uh, next slide, uh, myself and Ann. Uh, I have been with Van Deventer Black for 24 years and uh, it, almost exclusively practicing in construction, government contracts and commercial uh, litigation. I am the chair of the Norfolk Board of Zoning Appeals, and I have served as president of the Norfolk Portsmouth Bar Association and uh, a past chair of the Virginia Bar Association's construction law section. I'm a former Army officer, and like I said, I've, I've practiced at Van Deventer all my career in primarily construction law and litigation. Next slide. Anne is a partner in our labor and employment practice group and is the manager of the firm's litigation practice. She has advised and represented clients on labor and employment matters and in litigation for more than 20 years, both working for the federal government and in private practice. Uh, she's been a speaker for several matters and you'll hear her often in our labor and employment webinars and um, live seminars that she uh, presents. Next slide. 
So I'm going to start off here by talking about the money. Um, it's the General Assembly started out very promising for the construction industry, approving some two point due billion dollars in new infrastructure spending, much of it associated with higher education and state agencies, transportation, and then a key part of workforce development uh, for the governor's uh, initiatives, as well as for water quality and stormwater management projects. And then finally, everybody's read in the news about the different localities moving forward with casino uh, operations. That requires a locality vote to proceed, but should the, those localities approve casinos, part of those funds will go to school development or other municipal uh, developments. Next slide. However, all those good plans were put on hold by the COVID-19 emergency. Uh, the General Assembly had to place all new spending on hold uh, or the governor did uh, after the veto session. Uh, the Secretary of Treasury projects a $1 billion revenue shortfall this year, next year, and in 2022. Uh, each of those years, a $1 billion shortfall. So the governor has called for a special session this fall. We don't know if it'll be in late August or September to review all of the new spending priorities passed. So what happened was there was a, a, all this new spending was allotted in the biannual budget, but then these items had to become unallotted. That's the legislative weird term they've used. In addition, funds relying on bonding revenue uh, is to be determined at this point. Next slide. So what does this look like for new spending? Uh, the 900 in higher ev higher education and state agency projects is largely dependent on bond revenue, so that is to be determined. The maintenance reserve projects for higher education state agencies are not specifically identified, nor are they specifically unallotted, so it's unclear what their status is right now. Uh, new money for equipment on projects is on hold, as is part of the ta tech talent initiative. Uh, in part of the governor's workforce development plans. Uh, the stormwater lo local assistance fund, which requires local matching, is also dependent on bond revenue, so that is to be determined. What is not on hold is uh, the transportation funding. So highway construction maintenance, the transit and passenger rail, uh, a new local authority, for the Richmond area, and then changes that will increase funding for the Hampton Roads Regional Transit Fund. All of those are going into to effect in July and then October and May of next year, as we'll see, and is still going forward, uh, even though uh, some of that revenue might be not as high as anticipated. We'll take it to the next slide. So, Unallotted workforce development. The gov this was a big priority for the governor. His G3 Community College tuition program, uh, a $69 million workforce initiative in skilled trades and other high demand fields, which would really benefit the construction industry, had to be reallotted for now. Same thing with economic development, which included money for business ready site programs, unallotted. So I said before, the water quality improvement fund and the stormwater local assistant funds are bond dependent and so are to be determined. Next slide. So these major capital projects, 930 million worth, are in the budget, but they are bond dependent. So we're not, it's not clear now if these projects are going to be going forward, but these are some major projects that uh, was uh, the construction industry was hopeful would be moving forward and still have hope of that happening. In addition, as I said, some proceeds from casino operations will go to public school construction and to local governments. Uh, so that is in a, that money will be focused on those localities and is in addition to anything worth mentioned here. Uh, but that will take a year or more more like two to three years for that to actually occur. 
Next slide. So the transportation funding largely relies on a gas tax. That's a five cents increase occurring July 1 this year, and then again July 1 next year. It will then be indexed to the consumer price index so that we will not have to hopefully revisit this in the future. There are also changes to um, electronic uh, electric vehicles and uh, uh, the fee that they need to pay for using the roads. Uh, and then there are areas not subject to a regional gas tax now get a, a dedicated tax of 2.1%, and then there are changes to the regional programs as well. And so the while the we've seen a dramatic decrease in driving on Virginia roads, that will impact the gas tax and other revenue dependent for new uh, funding. Uh, VDOT anticipates that this offset by this increase in the gas tax will at least keep planned projects online. However, new projects may face some further delay. So important in there also is the I-81 bonding enables some 30 projects to go forward. That bonding is not on hold. As I said, the Regional Transportation Authority for the Richmond area will take effect in the fall, and that also enables a dedicated ta tax in that area for projects uh, priority in the, in the capital area. Uh, and it'll be similar to the Hampton Roads in Northern Virginia and even the I-81 areas. Increases and tweaks to the regional transportation authorities include uh, a transit occupancy tax and a grantors tax that will take effect in May of next year. And that's where we'll see some extra money for Hampton Roads. Next slide. So let's talk about some other good news uh, for the construction industry. Uh, Next slide. So the statute of limitations was a major emphasis for construction industry uh, and a lot of those trade groups. Uh, it, it, this bore out of the longstanding uh, principle that the state is not subject to a statute of limitations. This came in stark relief with a few cases, particularly out in Virginia Tech, brought some 14 years after completion of a project, and the general contractor had to uh, address the situation, and then subsequent cases found that that general contractor could not even look down towards his subcontractors who may have been responsible for the problem because the statute of limitations on written contracts in Virginia is five years and had already expired as do those subcontractors. So, uh, there was a lot of back and forth, a lot of industry dialogue with the state. Uh, the state resisted the efforts, but at the end of the day, the General Assembly overwhelmingly approved a statute of limitations that now applies to a state public body on any construction contract. Now, it, uh, that limitations period is 15 years after completion of the contract. What does completion mean? It's defined in this new statute as final payment to the contractor or 12 months from the certificate of occupancy or final acceptance by the owner, which is the term VDOT uses. So here, final payment is a key marker for when the statute of limitations begins to run. We uh, want to watch closely to see if state public agencies intentionally appear to delay what final payment is, uh, but there's at least this 12 month limit on how long they can delay that. There's also a separate statute that applies this same limitations period to architectural and engineering contracts so that there's no ambiguity. Uh, and the statute in the civil procedure section was specifically amended so that we can flow down this limitation from a general contractor down to the subcontractor and the supplier. So if you're a subcontractor or supplier, you also need to understand that when you review a new subcontract, you're likely going to be on the hook for the full period of whatever the general contractor is. Similarly, if you're a general contractor, you're going to want to make sure you make those changes so that you do not have risk that isn't covered by another party that's out there. Importantly, and there will be a lot of questions about this, I imagine, is uh, that the city, lo cities and localities are not subject to this 15-year period. Prior case law had already pretty much clarified that they're subject to the 
normal five year statute of limitations period. So it's going to be an important distinction between whether you're working for a state public body or a locality. There are other entities that are exempt from the Public Procurement Act, and they may not be included under either one, or they may be included under the five year period. So we're going to have to take a close look at what those individual contracts are for entities that are exempt from the Public Procurement Act. Uh, finally, the Prior to this law change, the uh, public projects had a one year limitation on bond claims, except for VDOT projects, which had a five year. Now all projects have a five year limitation period on performance bond claims. Next slide. So like I said, it's important if you're a general contractor to flow down the applicable limitations period. If you're an architect or engineer and you're hiring a sub consultant, you're going to want to do the same thing. Or if you're a subcontractor, you're going to want to review those contracts that are coming down to you and see what your long term obligation is for a specific project. Next slide. Some other changes in public contracting law. Uh, previously, in 2017, the General Assembly broadened the use of construction management and for localities it had a $10 million threshold in which they didn't have to make any really special findings to use construction management. That's now been taken away from the state and localities. They're now subject to the threshold set by the Secretary of Administration. That is currently $26 million. Below that, um, they need a written determination that competitive sealed bidding is not practical or advantageous. They also have to provide a number of other findings by the local approving authority to use construction management. Also, the small purchases exemption increases from 100,000 to 200,000 for single or term contracts other than professional services. Both of these take effect on July 1st of this year. Next slide. Some pre qualification changes. Uh, there's now specific language that a locality may include criteria for uh, bidders not pre qualified with VDOT. That can, and it's very broad and very vague, I'll say that. Uh, it can include a history or good faith assurances of, and this is by either the bidder or the potential subcontractors under that bidder. So it's extremely broad, but completion of specified training programs. We know, for instance, that AGC has partnered with Vosch for its Virginia Best program. That may qualify, but it's not absolutely clear at this point. Uh, there might be other safety programs. I believe ABC is participating in a similar program as well. Uh, participation by a bidder or potential subcontractors in apprenticeship training programs approved by state agencies or the Department of Labor. We believe this was specifically intended to benefit union contractors. Uh, however, we know that groups like ABC have approved training programs as well, so apprenticeship programs, so those are uh, something you will want to follow up on. And finally, it has this vague term of maintenance by the bidder or subcontractor of records of compliance with state applicable local and federal laws. We hope that all our contractors are complying with all applicable laws, so we're not sure about what the maintenance of records are. But uh, I think this is something to look out for in new pre-qualification standards by localities coming forward. Next slide. So some of the items that were defeated uh, that impacted the construction industry and many of which we will see again in future uh, legislative sessions, efforts to repeal right of work laws in Virginia, uh, use of employee fair share or agency fees, uh, best value contracting. There was a proposal to broadly use best value contracting and to get away from low bid contracting in Virginia. That was defeated. Uh, the use of prompt pay on all construction projects, whether public or private, that would essentially limit the ability to have pay when paid clause. That will be discussed this fall before the session begins every year. There's always a discussion about the definition of a small business in Virginia and whether to incorporate the federal SBA standards uh, that will reemerge. We expect 
Paid sick leave was a hot topic this year and it's expected to return. Limitations on arbitration clauses, specifically there were bills that uh, made it permissible for localities to consider whether a contractor or any subcontractor or any supplier to that uh, contractor uses arbitration clauses in employment or other contexts. It was very broad. It was an attempt to limit the reach of the Federal Arbitration Act. Uh, I would expect to see that again in the future. And again, some vague moral integrity criteria for responsible bidders. Instead, we got what we just went through, those three list of items for pre-qualification. Next slide. <clears throat> Hi, this is Ann. So I'm going to talk now about the massive sea change that we've seen this year in Virginia employment law. Up until now, we, we would look down our noses at other states like California that have laws that are very tilted against employers and in favor of employees because up until now, Virginia really didn't have any employment laws of its own or rather the laws it had were very weak and um, ineffective and most businesses really didn't have to worry about Virginia employment laws. We only had to pay attention to federal employment laws, but no more. Now Virginia has a slew of very employee friendly laws that have um, completely tilted the playing field. And the first one I'm going to talk about, you can go to the next slide, please. This is probably the, the least costly of the changes that the General Assembly made. And this is Virginia now has its own minimum wage. Up until now, we just followed the federal minimum wage. But starting on May 1st of next year, and this is one of those laws that the governor did delay because of um, the current economic crisis. But starting May 1st of next year, Virginia will have a minimum wage higher than the federal minimum wage, and that's going to be $9.50 an hour. It'll go up to $11 an hour in 2022. It'll go up another dollar to $12 an hour in 2023. And then there's going to be a pause, an economic study um, done in 2023 to see what the impact of this minimum wage has been. And then they'll vote whether to bump it up again to 13.50 an hour in 2025 and then $15 an hour in 2026. Um, the way the General Assembly looks right now, I would say it's very likely to occur. But of course, you know, with the current economic crisis, we might see additional changes in the political makeup of Virginia. This new minimum wage does apply to home care providers and also to cleaners. Um, those are groups that were previously excluded from Virginia's minimum wage. And it does not apply, however, to trade school or work study programs. Next slide, please. So prevailing wage has been a, a major topic at this last uh, General Assembly. This is again an item that the governor delayed until May of next year. It requires all state projects to use a prevailing wage determination based on the locality of the project. Uh, and this raises a big question about what data is available to set the wage rates in various localities across the Commonwealth. Uh, the standard is that it's as determined by the Commissioner of Labor and Industry on the basis of applicable prevailing wage rates determinations made by the Federal uh, Secretary of Labor under the Davis-Bacon Act. So it appears that the Commissioner has some discretion to vary because it says as determined uh, by the commissioner uh, on the basis of the uh, Davis-Bacon Act. So it will become very important for contractors to respond to surveys about prevailing wages in their area or else we're going to get set with Northern Virginia wages applicable all across the state. Uh, importantly, this is requires use of uh, prevailing wages on all state projects, but it is permissive by localities. So you will have to take a hard look at those localities to see if they're going to use prevailing wage. Um, and so we anticipate widespread use of certified payrolls as a result of this starting next year. But uh, for reasons you'll see as we go forward, I think you'll see widespread use of certified payrolls um, starting very shortly across the Commonwealth. Next slide. So we started with the good. We're going to go into the bad uh, and we're going to talk about a trio of some wage laws here. Next slide. 
So there's three laws, wage laws, we're going to talk about right now, the combination of which really raise the profile of risk for contractors working in the Commonwealth and, those, and makes it imperative that every contractor understand who is on site working for them or any of their subcontractors or suppliers. So the first we're going to talk about is a brand new statute. Uh, it was dubbed the Wage Theft Act, and it's combined with the next one that Ann will talk about. But uh, this is a big sea change. Any construction contract entered into after July 1st, 2020, uh, shall be deemed to include a provisions. In other words, it's implied in every contract that the general contractor and the subcontractor at any tier are jointly and severally liable to pay any subcontractor's employees all wages due. So uh, our clients are now responsible for everybody below them on a construction site, all the wages due. Uh, in what's even starker, is it says the general contractor is now deemed to be the employer of a subcontractor's employees subject to all pen penalties criminal and civil of an employer that fails or refuses to pay wages due it allows the sub or it allows the general contractor um, to make the subcontractor indemnify it for any damages unless the subcontractor's failure was due to the general contractor's failure to pay monies due to the subcontractor. And I want to stop there. This is this alone is a setup for lots of disputes. You can see already that a subcontractor say, I didn't pay my guys because you didn't pay me. Uh, and so therefore I shouldn't be liable. You should be liable uh, for all the criminal penalties, you general or the subcontractor above me. Uh, so this is a recipe for a lot of disputes. And uh, and then it goes further. Now it has a provision in here to try and protect this general contractor or subcontractor by saying that it requires proof that general contractor knew or should have known that the subcontractor was not paying his employees. But as we'll see as we go forward, we think that that allegation it, that every claimant making an allegation for past wages will allege that the general or the subcontractor knew or should have known and the standards are such that they may well succeed at that. Now it does apply to only projects greater than $500,000 that are not residential projects, but for most of our clients, um, they all work on projects larger than this. So this uh, deemed to be the employer is going to a bit be a big deal as we talk about these next couple of slides. Next slide. So the other aspect of this um, Wage Theft Act is a provision that um, regards the non-payment of wages. This goes into effect on July 1st of this year. Up until now, if an employee alleged that an employer failed to pay the employee for all work performed, under Virginia law, there really wasn't much of a remedy that you could file a breach of contract claim against the employer, but because there was no provision for attorney's fees, it was a very unattractive option for plaintiff's attorneys. The only real um, option for plaintiff's attorneys was to file an FLSA action, which would be an action under the Fair Labor Standards Act for either a failure to pay the minimum wage or a failure to pay overtime consistent with the Fair Labor Standards Act. But of course, there are many wage payment claims that would not be um, would not fall under the Fair Labor Standards Act. Well, now Virginia has this new private cause of action where any employee can bring a lawsuit against his employer either individually, jointly, or on behalf of similarly situated employees as a collective action, just like you can under the FLSA, to recover for the unpaid wages. Um, the interesting thing about the collective action aspect is if you're not familiar with how the FLSA works, that means an employee can just file a lawsuit by himself, but he titles the case as um, John Smith on behalf of himself and other similarly situated employees. And then the court will send out notice to all of your current and former employees, people who worked for you within the past three years, inviting them to opt into the lawsuit. So 
this is a major tool um, to be used against businesses to collect um, wages and the successful plaintiff can recover not just the wages that they prove there are owed but also double that amount as liquidated damages plus interest plus attorney's fees and costs and then if the plaintiff can show that the employer's failure to pay the wages was knowing and I'll go into what that means in a few minutes. But if they can prove that it was knowing, then they also recover triple the amount of wages due and attorney's fees and costs. So this is um, a very, very rich, lucrative source of payment for plaintiff's attorneys. And we're going to see a major impact on businesses. We expect, expect to see a lot of litigation arise out of this lawsuit simply because it's going to be um, a cash cow for plaintiff's attorneys. So every business basically has a target on it now. Um, if the, in addition to the private cause of action, the new law also gives the commissioner the ability to assess civil penalties against employers for knowing violations. And this is going to be an administrative procedure without any real appeal. The commissioner of the Department of Labor and Industry can send a determination to a business assessing the penalty when the penalty will will um, range up to a thousand dollars for each violation. The penalty would be payable to the commissioner and the employer only has 15 days to challenge the assessment through this administrative procedure and after that the commissioner's decision is final. Next slide please. Next slide please. Thank you. Um, oh I'm sorry you can go back one. Thank you. So with regard to knowing, the definition of knowing um, is actually rather broad. So the law sets forth that an employer, uh, it's a knowing violation if the employer acted with actual knowledge of the information about the non-payment of wages or acted in deliberate ignorance of the truth or falsity of information or act in reckless disregard to truth or falsity. So basically willful blindness or just not paying attention won't cut it for defense. That would probably probably be considered a knowing violation. Note that the law does not require any specific intent to defraud. Um, so the standard for proving knowing is going to be kind of low for plaintiffs to succeed and obtain those triple damages. In addition to the civil liability, there are criminal penalties for non-payment of wages now. Those um, can be up to $10,000 for a class one misdemeanor and more than $10,000 for a class six felony. Also, the commissioner on its own can bring an investigation and a lawsuit against a business even if no employee consents. So even if none of your employees have complained about non-payment of wages, the commissioner of the Department of Labor and Industry can launch an investigation and bring a lawsuit against your um, company for non-payment of wages. And in the process can also recover attorney's fees of up to one third of the award amount. Next slide, please. So what do you need to do to plan now? And I think it's important they, these laws go into effect on July 1st. And before I get to all of this list, I want to address we have a question um, that I think is appropriate to address now before we move off this topic. Question was under the Wage Theft Act, does uh, this flow down to include suppliers? And we believe it does. The Wage Theft Act says general contractor and subcontractor shall have the meaning ascribed to it under the Mechanics Lien Act. And if you look at the Mechanics Lien Act, subcontractor includes suppliers who provide materials to a project. So it again seems incredibly broad and difficult to protect yourself against because there's, um, we know of, of course, many suppliers say a steel fabricator is, is um, manufacturing the steel off site and the, who is on that job is difficult for the general contractor to track or understand. So um, the plan now, we expect to see a dramatic increase in the requirement for payment and performance bonds for subcontractors. And I'll remind you as we listen, the payment bond is for the benefit of those downstream or below that subcontractor. So the, if they have not been paid, they can bring an action against that payment bond. The performance bond is for the benefit of those above that contractor such as the general contractor or the owner depending on the case so that if 
the subcontractor has not paid wages and the general contractor has to, he, he or she with the general contractor can bring a performance bond claim against the sub saying they did not do their duties under the agreement between those parties. Uh, in addition, we know that there's many small businesses that do not have bonding capacity that so that they can provide these types of bonds. So you might see general contractors requiring alternate security letters of credit. But I'll remind you that if you're working on a public project, retainage is limited to 5%, uh, at least on a Virginia project. So you can't increase the amount of retainage uh, simply because you're you have questions about the subcontractor's ability to pay its employees. Instead, I think what you're going to see is a lot of um, uh, uh, joint check agreements instead. So as I've said earlier, I think instead you're going to see certified payrolls as a way for the general contractor to verify who is on the site, what they're being paid, what is their wage rate, and then representations regarding those certified payrolls that each person has been paid. You could even see proof of payment of employees before advancing payment, but I think this would cause a lot of difficulties with the uh, Prompt Pay Act as it stands in place right now for public projects. Like I said, you're going to see modified lien waivers uh, and subcontract indemnity requirements specifically addressing this issue. And this is important. Most of the general contracts or subcontracts we see have requirements that the general contractor reprove all sub subcontractors. Uh, however, I rarely see this done in practice. Uh, I think now it will be extremely important for the general contractor to understand if a subcontractor is subbing out part of its work so that they can understand who's on site and what are these individuals being paid. So this will have a huge impact on small and mid-sized contractors. It's really gonna increase the burden of administering these contracts and so if you you need to plan now how what are you going to do and how are you going to process the information that's coming up from subs and suppliers so that you can demonstrate that you don't meet these requirements of have knowledge or reckless ig ignorance of the information going on on your project next slide So here's where it really gets ugly. We've talked about wage theft. We've talked about uh, payment to employees, but now you've got to add into that the misclassification mis of employees on a project. Next slide. So for several years now, the general, or I'm sorry, for several years now, Virginia has been um, becoming more interested in this issue of worker misclassification. And this is where a business has classified a worker as an independent contractor rather than an employee. And the government, including the federal government, is always concerned about this because that means less tax revenue. If you've got someone classified as an independent contractor, you're not withholding payroll taxes, you're not paying the, you're not including them with the VEC tax payments etc. And so the government misses out on some tax dollars. So they've been concerned about this for a while. Um, and we had seen some um, extra effort by state agencies to enforce this issue. Um, but now this has uh, become much more serious because this new law that goes into effect on January 1, it's actually four new laws, creates a legal presumption that any worker who performs services for business for remuneration is an employee. So there's now a legal presumption that any worker for your company is an employee and the burden will be on the business to prove otherwise and they'll have to prove otherwise by application of an IRS test for an independent contractor. And this is a multi-factor test that looks at different elements of control, behavioral control, financial control that the business has over the worker to determine whether or not the worker is actually an independent contractor or an employee. But because of this legal presumption, businesses have to be extremely careful now for anyone that they consider to be an independent contractor and look very closely at that relationship. Having a written document that declares the individual to be an independent contractor is insufficient as a matter of law. You're going to have to dig deeper than that. And it's a very tricky analysis that you're going to have to go through and really requires you to consult legal counsel. Um, if you have violated this test and if you have misclassified an, uh, an employee as an independent contractor, 
you can be debarred from public contracting in Virginia. So the consequences are very severe for contractors. You can lose out on public contracting. In addition, the worker will have a private cause of action against your company for unpaid wages. And that would, of course, include overtime pay because if they're saying that they should have been an employee and you weren't paying them, um, that means you weren't tracking their hours and you weren't paying them overtime. So they're going to be able to recover overtime. In addition, they get to recover employment benefits, and that would include um, any type of benefits, paid benefits that you provide to your employees. Plus, they get to recover any expenses that would have been covered by insurance. So, for example, if you offer your employees a group health insurance plan and, and one of your independent contractors, because he was not an employee, didn't have access to that plan and he got sick, and let's say he had a serious illness and a lot of doctor bills, the business will be liable for those doctor bills because those are expenses that would have been covered by insurance had he been properly classified as an employee. In addition to all of those costs, the worker will also be able to recover attorney's fees and litigation costs. So this can be extremely expensive for a business if they have misclassified a worker. Um, plus, there are civil penalties and these are assessed per individual that's been misclassified. It's $1,000 per individual for the first offense, $2,500 per individual for the second offense, and $5,000 per individual for subsequent events, offenses. There's also a prohibition in this law against retaliation. So businesses are not allowed to retaliate against a worker who questions or claims that they have been misclassified. Next slide, please. So the reclassification of an employee, of a worker to an employee, in addition to you're going to have to pay them their back wages and the other costs that I just talked about regarding insurance, you're going to have additional tax liability because, of course, you weren't withholding taxes on their behalf and um, paying other payroll tax liability issues. So you're going to owe more in taxes. As Jim mentioned, with this new liability that contractors have for their subs, this would include the general contractor and subcontract, subcontractors having wage liability for every worker on the site now. So that means that if a subcontractor has misclassified a worker, that is now a problem for the general contractor. So contractors do need to be proactive in learning the status of every worker on the project to make sure that they're properly classified and whether they've been paid. This is going to be a bonanza for plaintiff's attorneys. So you really do need to plan now for how you're going to go about monitoring and tracking all the workers on the job site to make sure that they're being properly classified as employees and being properly paid. Next slide, please. So the next slide has to do with project labor agreements, but I want to take a second. We've had a lot of good questions and I want to appreciate that and I want to try and address some of them as we're going along. One of the questions was, does the Wage Theft Act apply to projects that are already in progress? And the answer is they apply to contracts entered after July 1st. So it is possible that you were awarded a project on June 15th, signed the contract with the owner then, but don't enter into subcontracts until after July 1st. Those subcontracts would be subject to the Wage Theft Act. Um, it, there's another question here, and, and this may be uh, more up your alley. Did they void the accrued paid sick leave policy for federal projects? I believe the answer to that is no, but and yeah, you, uh, yeah, yeah. Right. So um, no, the, the paid sick leave for federal projects, that's just um, that applies to any federal contractor and the General Assembly did not address that. No. Uh, and then another question we have is about work being done off site and use of the prevailing wage. And I want to make sure we distinguish the Wage Theft Act as opposed to the prevailing wage. What is the proper rate that was supposed to be paid those workers? If you look at the prevailing wage law, uh, we've got another year for that to be implemented. So we've got some time for additional guidance to be issued. But if you look at the definitions there, they talk about those working on the site. So it does not appear that it applies to uh, uh, the provision of materials as a material supplier and what rates are paid to them. So I think that is something that we will see some further guidance in from the Department of Labor and Industry over the next year. 
but um, it, my plain reading of the statute is that it the um, that would not apply to those material suppliers. Um, for project labor agreements, this again was a lot of news for a lot of contractors and a big em point of emphasis for trade groups during the General Assembly. This again is something that the governor elected not to take effect until 2021. Previously, uh, the public law in Virginia was that state agencies could not require or prohibit adherence to a, a project labor agreement. So it meant that the state had to be neutral on those issues. Uh, that has changed uh, effective a year from now. Now it permits both the state or any locality to mandate the use of a project labor, labor agreement on any project. We understand this was first requested by some localities in Northern Virginia, so that's where we would first expect to see it used. But uh, I would also expect that pressure to spread across the state and be used in other localities going forward. Um, it, we do know that at least historical records show that the use of a project labor agreement uh, increases the cost of projects. And so public bodies are also on under a lot of pressure, especially with the COVID emergency with depleted funds to keep projects as uh, uh, effective, as cheap as possible. So we'll see how far this goes in the near future, but over the long term, we're telling you this now because now is the time for you to start to become familiar if you're not already under working under labor agreements um, there. We can give some further guidance as the year goes on. Uh, this is something to keep your eye on in the future more than anything else. Next slide. So now we're going to discuss some of the other new laws, employment laws that are going to put money in plaintiff's lawyer's pockets. Next slide, please. Non-compete agreements are now banned for employees who are considered low wage employees. Um, this goes into effect on July 1. It applies to agreements that are entered on that date and it prohibits employers from entering into enforcing or threatening to enforce a covenant not to compete with a so-called low wage employee. But one of the surprising things about this is the way that they've defined low wage employee means that anyone earning less than $59,000 a year, $59,124 a year will currently be considered a low wage employee and thus you cannot have a non-compete agreement with them. Essentially, they've tagged the low wage employee definition to the average weekly wage in the Commonwealth. And as of July 1, that's going to be $20.30 an hour, which works out to $1,137 per week or $59,124 annually. This law does apply to interns, students, apprentices, trainees, and independent contractors. Um, and importantly, it does not prohibit you from having a non-disclosure agreement. Those are still permissible. And non-solicitation agreements are going to be permissible, but you really need to be careful because some I've seen some non-solicitation agreements, and these are agreements where the employee is agreeing that they won't solicit your customers. I've seen some of them written broadly enough that they kind of um, cross the line and are more like non-compete agreements. So you really need to be careful with how your non-solicitation agreements are drafted to make sure you don't run afoul of this law. Um, the remedy, if you do have a non-compete agreement with a so-called low-wage employee, will be a private cause of action where the individual can recover attorney's fees and costs. Also, you can be subject to a $10,000 civil penalty. This law also requires that the business make a posting in the workplace, just like there are other laws that you have to have posters um, available to your employees in conspicuous places about various legal rights they have. This is another one you're going to have to add. And what the law says is that you either have to post a copy of the law itself or post a summary prepared by the Department of Labor and Industry. They have not prepared such a summary yet. I'm hoping that they'll do so before July 1. Next slide, please. The Virginia Human Rights Act has been amended. Uh, the Human Rights Act has been around for a long time, but it never got much attention because it really didn't have much teeth. It's basically, um, the state miniature equivalent of Title VII, Title VII being the federal law that prohibits discrimination on the basis of race, sex, religion, color, et cetera. 
Um, Title VII only applies to businesses that have at least 15 employees. So the Virginia Human Rights Act until now applied to businesses with fewer than 15 employees, but more than five. Um, now they've amended the law to give it much greater scope and also to increase the damages available. So the aspect of this law, and this goes into effect on July 1, the aspect of this amendment that got a lot of attention in the press was that they have, Virginia has now expanded the protected classes um, against which you're not allowed to discriminate to include sexual orientation and gender identity. The media paid a lot of attention to that aspect, which I actually think is the least significant change that the General Assembly made to the Virginia Human Rights Act. I think most employment attorneys would say even prior to that amendment, you could probably make out a pretty good case that sexual orientation or gender identity discrimination fits under sexual sexual discrimination. So in my mind, that wasn't that big of a change. The big change is the expansion of coverage of this law to any employer with more than five employees, five or more employees. The company will be covered under this law for non-age-based discharge claims. For age-based discharge claims, the law is still limited to employers with more than five and fewer than 20 employees. That's because the Age Discrimination and Employment Act, the federal law, kicks in when you have 20 employees. Um, but for other discrimination claims, this new amended Virginia Human Rights Act will apply to employers with 15 or more employees. So the, the cap on this law has been lifted. Um, it also requires public accommodation. In a private action brought under this lawsuit or under this, this amended law, the court can award compensatory damages, punitive damages, and attorney's fees and costs. As I said, um, in some ways, the Virginia Human Rights Act has in the past been kind of a miniature equivalent of Title VII, but no more, because Title VII has caps on how much a court can award in compensatory and punitive damages, and those caps under Title VII are based on the number of employees the business has. The Virginia Human Rights Act has no caps on damages, so there's no cap on the amount that the court can award in compensatory and punitive damages. So this change to the Virginia Human Rights Act has just made it a very attractive vehicle for plaintiff's attorneys to recover money from businesses. And because this is a state law, these claims will primarily be brought in <clears throat> state court. State court in Virginia, unlike federal court, doesn't really have a summary judgment procedure. Um, there are very um, limited exceptions to that, but for the most part, you cannot get summary judgment in Virginia state court. It just isn't allowed under the rules. And that means that whereas in federal court, if the facts, the undisputed facts show that the employer should prevail, there wouldn't be a trial in federal court. The federal court could grant what's called summary judgment and you wouldn't have to go before a jury. Well, in Virginia, that procedure doesn't exist. So even if there's no factual dispute about the key facts in the case, you're going to trial. So this is going to be um, a very expensive problem for businesses. In addition to a private cause of action, the law allows the attorney general to file suit against the business, in which case the court can impose civil penalties 50,000 for the first offense and 100,000 for the second offense and also award attorney's fees. Next slide, please. The Virginia law um, has for a while prohibited pregnancy discrimination, but now there is a new law that goes into effect on July 1 that expands those protections um, for pregnancy to prohibit discrimination based on pregnancy, childbirth, and related medical conditions, and to re require businesses to provide reasonable accommodations for those. Uh, this is very similar to the Americans with Disabilities Act, if you're familiar with that. It imposes an interactive process on businesses. So if a business um, learns that a employee needs um, assistance in performing his or her job, or I'm, I'm sorry, her, obviously her, if an employee needs um, assistance in performing her job because of pregnancy, childbirth, or related medical conditions, which would include lactation, then the employer has to engage in an interactive process, meaning the employer has to have a dialogue with the employee about what accommodation the employee likes. The employer has to analyze whether or not it would be an undue hardship to provide that accommodation, and then the employer basically needs to negotiate with the employee to find an accommodation that wouldn't be an undue hardship and that would allow the employee to perform her job. This law also creates a private cause of action for pregnancy discrimination. 
and and this is important because the deadline to start doing this is coming up as July 1, you have to provide a notice to your employees of both the prohibition against discrimination and the employee's right to reasonable accommodations. You have to post that notice in conspicuous places. You have to include it in your employee handbook, so you need to revise your handbook now. You have to give notice of these protections to all new employees, all new hires, including the men. Doesn't make sense, but the law is very broad. It says you have to give it to all new employees. And then any employee who announces that she's pregnant, you have to give her a copy of the notice within 10 days of that announcement, even though you've already given her the announcement when she was hired, and even though you have it posted in the workplace and in the handbook, you still need to give it to her again within 10 days of her announcing that she's pregnant. Next slide, please. Uh, the General Assembly also passed a new law that protects an employee's right to discuss his or her wages. Um, this, if you're familiar with the National Labor Relations Act, this has actually been the law of the land for, an, um, for decades. It has been, under the National Labor Relations Act, illegal to prohibit non-supervisory employees from discussing their wages. Nonetheless, I frequently see employee policies that include such a prohibition. We tell our employees they can't talk about their wages, and that's illegal. But the National Labor Relations Act, as I mentioned, only applies to your non-supervisory employees. This new Virginia law um, expands this protection to all employees. So you're not allowed to discharge or retaliate against any employee for discussing wages. The only exemption would be for what we call confidential employees, and those are employees who have access to compensation information of other employees or applicants as a part of their essential job functions, unless the disclosures in response to a formal complaint or charge in furtherance of an investigation, proceeding, hearing, or action, or consistent with a legal duty to furnish information. Next slide, please. Pay stubs, you may have seen that last year the General Assembly passed a law that um, went into effect on January 1 of this year requiring businesses to include a written statement with every paycheck that shows the number of hours worked, the pay rate, gross wages, and an itemization of deductions. A major problem with last year's law was that it applied to all employees, including employees whose hours you don't track, and that would be your FLSA exempt employees. Um, the Department of Labor and Industry had recognized that that was a problem, and so they delayed enforcement of that aspect of the law until July 1 of this year. Well, now the General Assembly has corrected this, so the law has been amended to restrict the requirement for reporting hours to exclude your FLSA exempt employees. So you do have to still report the hours on pay stubs of your non-exempt employees, but for your exempt employees, you don't have to report hours worked. Next slide, please. So there are a number of action items that businesses need to take now to protect themselves against um, this risk of liability that the General Assembly has created with all these new pro-employee laws. First of all, I do recommend you give some consideration to arbitration agreements with your employees. This is not a one-size-fits-all. Fit all. It's not appropriate for all businesses in all circumstances, and it's definitely an area where you need to consult with legal counsel because employment arbitration agreements are fraught with complexity and can be difficult to enforce. There are a number of um, cons and pros that you need to weigh in considering whether or not you want to do arbitration agreements with your employees. But if it is a good fit for your business, one of the great advantages is that the disputes you have with your employees under this ver these various laws will be taken out of the court and put in an arbitration. And that means you avoid juries and um, that can give you some additional protection. You can also, in arbitration agreements, have employees agree that they will only bring claims individually. So that avoids the risk of a collective action, and collective actions are where liability can get very expensive for businesses. So that's just something you really ought to give some consideration to. It doesn't mean it's necessarily right for your business, but something to at least explore. Um, all businesses do need to revise their employee handbooks, and you need to do that now before July 1. And that, um, in those revisions, you're going to need to address the new prohibition on discrimination um, based on sexual orientation or gender identity. You're going to need to address the new protections for pregnancy, childbirth, and related medical conditions, including lactation. 
and the requirement that you will provide a reasonable accommodation for pregnancy and those related issues. All businesses also need to take a look at any employee agreements that they have that have post-employment restrictive covenants to see if you're running afoul of the um, prohibition on non-competes. As I mentioned, the law only applies to non-competes that are entered into on or after July 1st, but with the prohibition on trying to enforce those agreements, you're going to have a lot of problems and you need to start looking at your, your procedure for who you have in turn to non-competes to make sure that you're not having people who make less than 59000 a year sign those agreements. If you have any independent contractors, you need to take a very close look at those relationships to confirm that they are actually independent contractors under the IRS test because now the legal presumption is that they're not, that those people are actually employees. This is the opportunity to train your employees on the expanded definition of, dis dis of discrimination under Virginia law. And also you need to train your employees and in particular your supervisors on timekeeping. It's um, pretty common in these disputes regarding wage payment, um, as we've seen under FLSA actions, that there will be an allegation that employees were performing work off the clock and that the supervisor was allowing it to happen. So you have to tighten up your timekeeping policies and make sure your supervisor is aware of what those policies are. There are a number of post posting requirements you need to take care of. You should already have up in your workplace the Families First Coronavirus Response Act poster regarding the paid leave requirements under that law. That poster should be up and if you have fewer than 500 employees, you need to have that up through the end of this year. You're also, as I mentioned, going to have to post a notice about non-compete agreements, the prohibition on them, and also a notice about the new um, protections for pregnancy, childbirth, and related medical conditions. And critically, if you have minimum wage employees, you're going to need to budget now for those minimum wage increases. Next slide, please. So I want to finish up talking about some issues with subcontracts and subconsulting agreements before we get to all of your questions and answers, which I do want to make sure we get to. Uh, so let's talk about some subcontractor issues first. So tucked away in the mechanics lien statute is a was a rarely used statute that made it a crime for any contractor or subcontractor quote with the intent to defraud close quote to retain or use funds for any purpose other than to pay for those working on the project. Uh, it was rarely used because no Commonwealth's attorney wanted to dive into the complexity of a construction site and bring a criminal action against somebody. So I'd only seen it crop up a couple of times, uh, but there was no real teeth to it because there was no civil action available. Now that has changed. Um, it, effective July 1st, there's now a civil cause of action for any party in contract. In other words, a subcontractor can sue its general contractor, a sub sub can sue its sub, uh, but uh, or an employee can sue a party that is for whom it is doing the work. Uh, it, it doesn't allow you to jump those lines of privity for a sub sub contractor to sue the general contractor. However, what's important here is that statute says the intent to defraud means uh, Basic evidence, the prima facie case is made if the use of the funds before payment occurs is prima facie evidence of the intent to defraud. So all they have to do is show that the funds were paid to the guy and the guy did not pay you. And that's the prima facie evidence of an intent to fraud. It essentially creates a separate fraud action in Virginia. It does not affect However, a contractor's right to withhold payments for performance reasons, disputed items. Next slide. The real kicker though in this statute is that it contains uh, a new prohibition on the right of offset. Any contract or subcontract provision that allows a party to withhold funds due under one contract for alleged claims or damages on another contract is now void as against public policy. So uh, you would need to review your general contracts or subcontract agreements. Almost all of them have a clause allowing a right of offset. Those are now um, a void and against public policy. So presumably that applies to contracts that are already in effect. Uh, next slide. 
In addition, uh, the indemnity provisions applicable to architects and engineers have changed. Uh, already, uh, architects and engineers follow the same standard that contractors do in Virginia, that uh, you cannot, uh, an indemnity provision is unenforceable if it attempts to seek damages for or reimbursement of damages for bodily injury or property damage caused solely from the negligence of the other party. Those were unenforceable for contractors. They're also unenforceable for architects and engineer agreements. Uh, previously, architects and engineers um, also had a prohibition against indemnity agreements against liability arising out of bodily injury, damage to property in a contract with a public body. Uh, this year, added to this same statute, requires a clause that any clause that requires a duty to defend by the architect or engineer is void and unenforceable. So we see that it, a duty to defend the indemnified party of, often exists in many indemnity clauses in the construction industry. Uh, many contractors use their same subcontract form for architects and engineers. Uh, not everything is applicable. We advise you to develop separate consulting agreements when you're dealing with design professionals, and this would be one of those reasons going forward. Uh, and so this applies to contractors that have consulting agreements, or it could apply to A&E firms who are then entering into other consulting agreements. Next slide. So what's coming, um, Anne, you can talk to, about the first two issues here. Sure, so Jim mentioned earlier that one of the um, attempt, one of the legislative initiatives that was defeated this year in the General Assembly was uh, an attempt to repeal Virginia's right to work law. We do expect to see that attempted again. And related to that was an attempt to um, modify Virginia's work, right to work law to allow either employee fair share fees or agency fees as they're sometimes called. And this is basically um, a law that would allow businesses to enter into an agreement with unions requiring non-union members to pay a portion of the union dues. Um, as I said, that was something that was attempted this year. It failed. We expect to see that attempted again next year. There is also an attempt this year to have requirement for all businesses to provide paid sick leave to their employees that failed i'm sure that will come back again so also as i said earlier uh the proposal that best value contracting be broadened in virginia we expect to see such a proposal to reemerge again uh same thing with prompt pay provision on both private and public contracts and a weakening of the ability for contractors to use pay when paid provisions uh, definitions of small business and like I said earlier limitations on the use or at least discouraging the use of arbitration clauses and talked about the importance uh, for some people to use them in their employment agreements and we often see them in uh, subcontract agreements in supplier agreements uh, purchase orders uh, we don't know how this will re-emerge and we're just going to have to keep our ear to the ground for what may happen in 2021 Next slide. So we've got a number of questions, which I'm happy about. And I'm also happy that some of our partners are listening in to give us um, some of their thoughts. Uh, one thing I note that I may not have properly explained what a project labor agreement is. I want to make sure it's clear that it is a um, it's it's a pre hiring collective bargaining agreement. Um, usually with one or more labor organizations that establishes the terms and conditions of employment for a specific project. So before any workers are hired, construction unions have bargaining rights to determine the wage rates and benefits of everybody working on that project. Uh, and so that's what is now permissible and will probably first occur in Northern Virginia. But I think um, most localities in the state recognizes that it increases the cost of construction in general in Virginia, and they're now under severe budgetary limitations. So that's project labor agreements. Let's go through some of the other questions that I may not have already addressed. Um, I think we have a question in here. Uh, I already addressed the one about projects where work is completed offsite. I think it depends if you're a supplier as opposed to a subcontractor. Uh, how can subcontractors, contractors protect themselves from lawsuits? I think that's why we're giving this. Uh, 
I think there's a number of strategies, but everybody's going to have specific needs depending on what your administrative, what you're able to absorb administratively, what can you pass on. Uh, there's going to be no cure all to prevent um, preventing these wage claims. And so it's a matter of being prepared and being in a position so that there isn't a knowing allegation against you. Um, will Mike ask, I'm glad our managing partner is listening. Um, will it, the Wage Theft Act impact payment bond premiums and claims? I'm not a, um, uh, I don't sell bonds, but in talking to the brokers that do, they anticipate that there will be more demand for them. So therefore premiums will increase especially for those who are less able to um, have the bonding capacity. Uh, I think that's a business thing that we will have to wait and see how that how that plays out. Uh, let's see what other questions we have here. Uh, and I don't know if you can address the accidental pay, if you've corrected something, uh, uh, you see that question there, an employer you let's accidentally see. pay. Yeah. Yeah, if an employee, employer you accidentally pay an employee the wrong wage rate or the employee needs payroll correction as knows by the employer can restitution attempts to be, be made to correct this without penalty of the employee. Um, it, it's going to depend on the gravity of the error and the amount of time that's passed since the error occurred. Um, most likely you will be able to correct it and as a general rule when you notice such um, mistakes the best thing to do is to correct it quickly but it also depends on how widespread it is in the company if it was just an one individual or if it was multiple individuals whether you'll be able to correct it but um, certainly that's something you want to try to address as quickly as possible and that's one of the reasons why it's good to periodically review your payroll practices so that you can catch such errors certainly if an employee brings it to your attention that he's been shortchanged and you decide he's correct you should quickly correct that um, it remains to be seen whether or not you'd be um, subject to a penalty. I don't think you'd be subject to a civil penalty under the law, though. And then I think similar to that question is asked, can you get the employee to make a to sign something when he receives this check saying this is everything and I don't have any other claims? Uh, how effective are those going to be? That's not going to be very effective at all. Um, it depends on how you do it. You might it might create a document that could be used in evidence to show that the employee's subsequent claims that he was shortchanged are not credible. But most likely, it's not going to help you a whole lot, and that's because um, it would be very easy for the employee to say that he didn't realize at the time, particularly if he was given a proposition that he was going to have to sign this document. He may have misunderstood whether he was going to get paid without signing it. The law, I don't think, would give much weight to this type of document, so I don't think it's going to be of much assistance to an employer. And then um, another question here is again, how far down does this wage theft act flow? Easy to track offsite manufacturing, but what is uh, uh, mechanical, electrical, concrete materials, doors, windows? You know, where does your liability end? I think a lot of this goes to the knowing standard. You know, how much are you expected to know about the labor practices of a window manufacturer five states away? I think the answer to that is not much. Uh, however, if you're if you have a steel fabricator um, that you've worked with frequently and they're also doing the erection work and it's hard to divide those two, that might be a closer call. So the statute is incredibly broad. Uh, I think that you will see efforts to rein in this statute with some further limiting legislation in the next couple of years. But right now, um, it appears broad enough that you would want to incorporate language and in purchase orders that help insulate you, attempt to insulate you from these uh, assertions of, of wage claims. Uh, do we ha if we don't have any other questions, I, I know we've gone a little bit over our time. Um, uh, I have one last question. How applicable are these changes to um, residential contractors? You notice, I think I said it earlier, the Wage Theft Act applies, does not apply to residential work and only applies to projects that are greater than 500,000, both of those conditions. So it has to be a public or not a public project. A any um, private or public project worth greater than 500,000 that is not a residential project. However, um, some of these other provisions relate to public jobs such as the use of prevailing wages that is mandatory 
that will become mandatory on state jobs and optional for local local jobs. Misclassification workers, as Anne can address, applies to all industries, not just the construction industry. Correct. Um, yeah. So it, you know, there's a, a confluence of a lot of different laws that impact different uh, contractors, and so that's why we can't on this webinar give specific advice for you. We hope you'll follow up with us so that we can help tailor your agreements and your practices so that you're prepared for what's coming. Uh, this is our thank you very much for tuning in. Uh, th these are our contacts if you need any more information and uh, and we'll be sending you a thank you that should have both a link to the slides and to this presentation. Uh, if there's nothing further, thank you very much for your time today.